this room gets bigger every year. I cannot believe it. I love my customers and partners because you guys show up so early for us. And I'll tell the story I always tell. The first year we did this, I said, I'm having a 7 a.m. breakfast. And Andy Jassy and Adam Slepsky at the time said, are you joking? Nobody's going to come to a 7 a.m. breakfast. I said, yes, they will. Public sector people get up really early. We start our day super early, and we go 24-7. And it's always been filled, and it gets bigger every year. And this year, we even threw you for a loop because we changed it 30 minutes earlier because Andy changed his keynote. So be prepared to sit for a while for the keynote, I'll just say that. So thank you all for coming this morning. How's reInvent going? You happy? Good. We want you to be happy, delighted. So I want to thank really quickly some of our sponsors. This could not be possible. I also want to thank my marketing team and my sales uh, team and technical team who's just done an awesome job. But I want to thank CloudAware, CloudChecker, Esri, Evident.io, Intel, and Novetta. And I have to give two special shout outs. Novetta last year sponsored uh, our party, thank you. But CloudChecker, sponsored um, my workout at sales kickoff. Where's Cloud Checker? Uh, hopefully you're in the room somewhere. But they were awesome. They came, <laughs> they came and said, we want to sponsor your workout. So we had workout bottles that had Cloud Checker. So thank you for that. All right, now let's get started. We have great presenters for you today. We have some amazing customers. But let's talk about things, 6.4 billion things. And this is the last time that Gardner issued a report. They said 6.4 billion connected things will be in use in 2016. Well, raise your hand in here if you're wearing a Fitbit or any kind of device or sensor on you. iPhones that have sensors, a lot. A lot of people have these devices on. And I know pretty much all of us use some kind of smartphone. Well, guess what? That number just went up to 20.8 billion things by 2020. So just four years from now, we're going to have more things connected in this world. So we're living in this society now that everything is connected to everything else. And the biggest takeaway from this stat is that how do we all become connected in a different way? And really, that is what the, the cloud, the Internet of Things, has become one of these major ways. And if you've been to any of our sessions and when you hear in the keynote today, you're going to hear a lot more about IoT, Lambda, how we're changing the world in a secure manner through connectedness. And organizations as well are becoming connected or are trying to figure out how they do this in a much more efficient way. And uh, the, the groups you hear today, the institutions we work with, both government, ed tech, not-for-profits, NGOs, educational institutions, are, they're saying to us now, it's simply not possible to do the work that we did in the past without having a new model from a traditional IT infrastructure. So today, and you're going to hear a little bit of a new number on stage today, but we have 2,300 government customers, about 7,000 educational institutions, and over 22,000 not-for-profits. And each of our customers and each of you are definitely connected. Now. Um, if you think about how these companies today work together, at our summit just this year, we had over 5,400 people come to our summit in Washington, D.C. And in that summit, we had programs where we had uh, both our partners and our customers saying, we want new offerings. We want new things that we can stay connected. So I don't know, if, how many of you were in the partner event yesterday? How many of you were able to go to the partner event? Well. Did you hear that we announced a new competency for public sector partners? I hope you did, because we've been working on that for a while, and it was really important that we get our public sector partners a competency that helps them stay and become connected. Another way that we're doing that is around the world, we're starting to create these uh, centers of innovation. We affectionately call them kicks or meeting spaces. And this is an example of one that we just opened in Busan, South Korea, that we're bringing together venture capitalists, startups, uh, governments, educational institutions to tackle challenges 
around how do they create job skills and understand a new environment of IT and cloud. So let's take some time here this morning to connect with each other. Uh, Allison said to make sure I clicked that because did you notice how that plug went? That was really important to her that you all saw how that plug got connected. <laughs> so I want you guys to make sure that you're connecting today with each other. The main reason we actually have this breakfast is so you guys get to know each other. Because as you know, coming to Las Vegas is sometimes challenging for a public sector customer. In the early days, I was more concerned about getting any government customers to come at all. Even the educational customer said, you know, it's, it's tough. But I think this conference has established a lot of credibility. And because of that credibility now, you can see the audience is growing rapidly because it actually is a learning conference. And it's a conference to be connected and to understand from each other how you are doing things in a new way. And the other thing that I just wanted to, to share is sort of the enterprise model that's changed. One of the big takeaways for me yesterday as I connected with people, they came up to me and said, it's so great to see that you all have more content on migrations, you have more content on enterprises, you have more content on how we drive and develop mission critical solutions on Amazon Web Services. And as you connect, I have some amazing customers here for you today that you're going to hear from. And uh, in the government ag agencies and organizations around the world, what they talk about is infusing innovation into every mission. And the infusion of innovation into every mission is really uh, critical. In fact, at our CAB yesterday for CIOs, uh, John, uh, John Edwards, who's now the CIO of CIA, talked about in this meeting about what they're doing around mission and how they're really staying connected through cloud and how they've been able to rapidly move forward on the applications that they're developing because they have that opportunity to fail fast and recover and have experimentation. Well, there's one group that I'm really excited about in the Department of Defense that that is the Digital Defense Services. Now these guys are a Ranger team, they're a SWAT team. They are small, but they are highly effective. And they are working to change the world of the Department of Defense. They're infusing innovation and they're going around and really helping DOD understand new ways that they can take their global mission to the next level. And we really appreciate what they're doing in this really highly regulated environment where there's also multiple budgets, multiple missions, and how do you begin to infuse some of that in an, in an environment that's traditionally uh, moves slowly sometimes from an IT perspective. So with that, I'd like to invite Chris Lynch to come to the stage. Chris, I don't know if you know him, but, but he's very cool. He's the Director of Defense Digital Service. He prides himself in his hoodies, he says. And he, he's, he's done things like hack the Pentagon, next generation GPS. He also helped start uh, the digital service at the White House, and he's absolutely a serial entrepreneur. So I want you to welcome him with a big round of applause. Chris. <laughs> So speaking of connected devices, uh, my heart rate is 102 beats per minute right now. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about um, why, well, not only being here, but why this is kind of the weirdest moment in my life. Um, it's pretty spectacular. I actually, um, I have an office in the Pentagon. Uh, I, now, you guys don't know me, but that's a pretty weird thing, right? I work for the Department of Defense. The door to my office, it says Rebel Alliance. True story. But here's the thing. Every week, I get to meet with generals from all over our military who come and visit us. That's pretty cool, because guess what? They're not the ones from Star Wars. These are like the real deal, right? These are the real generals who run all these things that you see in our military. It's pretty spectacular. It's really weird. Um, so uh, Teresa mentioned, we are a defense digital service. We're a spin out from the United States Digital Service. Um, we're really tasked with this idea of bringing in the best talent, technology, and processes from the private sector to transform how we do things within the federal government. To you, that probably sounds uh, you've all probably experienced this in some way. It's hard, right? It's really difficult. 
Um, so that's what we're focused on. That's what we do. Um, United States Digital Service was formed at the not so successful launch of healthcare.gov. You probably remember that. Six people were able to sign up for health, health insurance on the first day. Six people, right? I don't think anybody in this room would consider that to be a successful launch, right? But here's the thing. I believe deeply that people like you and people like me can show up in government and make a difference. And I'm gonna tell you a couple stories about how we're doing that and real things that we're able to do today that I'm pretty proud of. And Amazon's actually been pretty helpful in us uh, being able to pull off some of this stuff. But the first thing I wanna tell you about is something called service treatment records, or STRs. Most of you probably have no idea what these are. They're actually the medical records that, for the most part, tell the life of the brave men and women who serve our country. They basically are the document that's used by the Department of Veteran Affairs to make sure that when they leave the DOD and they fall under the care of the VA, that they're able to get the treatment and the care that they need, right? It's a pretty serious, important document. But here's the thing. When we showed up to look at that project, there were about 20,000 documents that had silently failed moving over from the VA to the DOD, or from the DOD to the VA. 20,000 documents, but that's not, the, that's not the big one. On top of that, doctors are scanning new medical forms, right, taking paper, scanning it into pictures, scanning these documents, and they're faced with an innocuous selection of three file formats for the medical records that they're scanning in. PDF, TIFF, or JPEG? Really quick, think, which one would you pick, right? But here's the thing, they don't know the impact of what they're actually doing, right? But here's the thing, there's only one file format, one, that's the correct answer, PDF. Because the VA will only accept PDFs. What do you think happens to the other documents? They silently disappear. Amazing, right? On top of that, they hadn't shipped a major software update in about 18 months. So what would you do? I'll tell you what we did. It wasn't really that complicated when you think about it. We got them shipping to production every two weeks, right? Like this is something that most of you would probably do in any other thing that you're working on, right? Every two weeks. On top of that, we actually worked with them to do uh, things like getting rid of a tech stack that didn't really make sense. They were actually using SharePoint as the database. They weren't using SharePoint, it was the database. That's pretty amazing, right? Because that's not the way it's supposed to be used. And on top of that, we wrote file converters, right? The documents, when they disappear, here's what they are. They're the document that says that I was exposed to hazardous chemicals and I need chemotherapy for my cancer treatment. That's the document. I get goosebumps every time I tell that story. That's why I showed up. I want to tell you about another project, GPS. You've probably used it. You're familiar with it. it stops us from driving into lakes if it works right. Um, so it turns out the DOD runs that, right? We actually run GPS. And uh, we're working on a new version. It's bigger, better, bolder, faster, stronger. All these things, it's really, really cool. This whole new version is going to replace the constellation of satellites sitting in the sky today. It's really, really cool. I can't wait for it to come to your phone in the future. It's not going so well. See, if every one of us were to leave this room today, we were to go out and start a new software company, what is the first thing you would do? You'd probably work on a tool set that was... You know, they took care of things like uh, automated build, automated deployment, configuration, all these things, right? But what if you actually waited until you had about 900 people billing on the project, you had about 20 major system components, and on top of that, you had a couple million lines of code? What if you waited that long? <laughs> it's pretty hard, right? So I'll tell you what we're doing, and this is pretty cool. We actually deployed the first ever national security system, or as D in DOD parlance, impact level five, system to Amazon's GovCloud, right? So we're working on things like automated build, deploy, all this stuff. But here's the impact of it. 
When we're done with the thing that we're working on, we're gonna take something that took three weeks and we're gonna take that down to 15 minutes for something, yeah, right? <laughs> they know. So that's the really cool thing. You know, I'll just mention, because I'm running out of time here, we also do something called Hack the Pentagon. It was the first ever federal bug bounty. I just wanna say, we did something called Hack the Pentagon. And it was the first ever federal bug bounty. And it's going really well. Um, but I'll, I'll finish this out with this. Um, this is a little bit of a call for help from you. Um, we need people like you and we need people like me. This stuff doesn't fix itself, it's not easy, right? But the most boring, mundane, everyday part of your skill set that you take for granted is novel and unique and matters. It matters. I hope that you'll come join what we're doing in some way, bring what you know, Help us move this stuff onto a cloud where we're not racking and stacking servers and trying to figure out how to maintain this stuff anymore. Please do that or come join us. Come join the Rebel Alliance. Go to usgs.gov. I hope to see you come and join this fight with me because I believe that it's important and I believe that you're the answer. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, we're really excited to be working with them. And also, he mentioned healthcare.gov, and that runs on AWS uh, now. And I think you noticed since it ran, runs on AWS, you haven't really heard any issues because then it started scaling. So the nice thing is we don't worry about really if you want to go sign up for healthcare benefits that you're not going to be able to get on the site anymore. Um, so, so thank you, Chris. It's good to hear, you can hear what DOD now is trying to do to achieve a new level of effectiveness. Um, now, let's turn to another way that we're becoming more connected, which is our connected research. And I'll tell you, since the day we started the public sector business, this has been a true labor of love to try to get more researchers access to the technologies and the information and data they need to do their work starting from the early days of us putting the 1,000 genomes in the AWS cloud so um, hundreds of thousands of new researchers could come to that data set to now we're trying to change the world in another way with another amazing group called the American Heart Association. And with the American Heart Association, Nancy Brown is here today, and I'm going to introduce her in just a minute, who's the CEO of the American Heart Association. But one of the things Nancy came to us on, she said, look, we've got heart disease, strokes, high blood pressure, still the number one killer in the world, and we're not doing enough. And we talked about what's AWS doing to connect the world in different ways. And one of the ways that we've been doing this is we've been putting up the most highly curated public data sets on AWS. We have over 50 now that run on AWS. We're trying to get more. And the whole idea of these data sets is to crowdsource and let people come to these data sets and have the opportunity to take advantage of, again, data that they've never been able to access before. If you think about this, the individual, the individual researcher, the individual educator, a small community college. This allows new ways to get to information that was never even considered. Uh, one of the examples that we have here is NOAA's NEXRAD data saw a 230% increase in their usage of data, but a 50% decrease in usage of their own services because of AWS, which is a good thing. They're not consuming their own resources, they're going out and using a public resource that really allows them to do more with actually what they have. But now our data sets are being accessed more than a billion times and being hit over and over again, and the stories we have are phenomenal. We could spend the day just talking about this. Smart cities and IoT that we're just talking about, connected devices. The city of Chicago open grid program where they literally have real-time awareness of everything happening on the grid. Singapore is another example of that with one map where they're looking at every connected element of the city of Singapore. And coming soon, our team has been working on a new uh, program or a tool called Research at AWS. And that'll be on our website shortly that's gonna allow researchers to understand how they use AWS to be really effective from a research perspective. So, now with that, the most important person to get on this stage is Nancy Brown, because she is the most passionate, get it done lady I've ever met. 
So Nancy, please welcome to the stage, and she's going to tell you about what AWS and the American Heart Association are doing together in a game-changing changing precision medicine platform. Nancy, welcome to the stage. Good morning, and Teresa, thank you for that great introduction. We are so proud at the American Heart Association of the amazing work that we have been doing with our colleagues at AWS to define a new way to use data and information to really solve problems that people care deeply about, and hopefully each of you care deeply about, and that is curing heart disease, stroke, and other forms of illness that impact people's lives. My guess is uh, all of you in this room have been or know someone impacted by heart disease and stroke. And so we're really pleased to see um, how well and how fast cloud computing can be used for new models of research and new models of gathering and utilizing patient-generated data. And that's what I want to uh, talk about today. Just to give you a sense of the impact, and Teresa mentioned this, cardiovascular diseases, which include heart attacks, stroke, high blood pressure, vascular disease, claim 17 and a half million lives a year in the world, seven million of those from coronary heart disease. And if you look at the world's billion poorest people, the billion poorest people in this world, the largest killer of the billion poorest people are things like congenital heart defects and rheumatic heart disease. And so we have a real sense of urgency at the American Heart Association to do everything we can to solve these health problems through science and through research. And, through research. and so when we think about um, the opportunities for creating new models for access and sharing of data, analytics, um, to improve patient outcomes, we recognize that there are many things that have stood in the way of this. Um, when you look across the landscape of science and research, this is a world that has been very siloed. Um, scientists and researchers have spent their careers building um, studies of patients that they carefully protect and carefully curate and feel great sense of ownership in because of the personally identified nature of this patient-generated data. Drug companies in um, the world have vast amounts of data that they have used to get drugs through FDA approval, and all of these data sets live in separate um, places, and that's a problem that needs to be fixed. And so at the American Heart Association, a couple of years ago, we created an institute for precision cardiovascular medicine. Our goal is to help define more precise ways to identify, treat, and prevent diseases. So for example, if you go to the doctor today, and you're diagnosed with high blood pressure, let's just say, you know, chances are you're going to go through a year or two of trial and error as the doctor tries to figure out which blood pre pressure medication, how much water pills, what, do you need a beta blocker to control your blood pressure? There's not a way right now to be able to look at deep information about you compared to information about others and tailor your treatment based upon your specific information. And this is a problem that needs to be fixed for the world's largest killer and the biggest um, contributor to healthcare costs in this country and in the world. And so at the American Heart Association, um, an organization over 90 years old that has spent $4 billion on research in the past 40 years, we decided we needed to take this on. We needed to bring together the world's experts and help us create a roadmap for precision medicine. And there's no question that when you think about what it will take to actually have precision cardiovascular medicine, this is certainly a science and medical problem, but it's really a technology problem because we have to find a way to bring all this data together in a way that can be more rapidly accessed and studied. And that is why earlier uh, this year, we were so delighted to announce a new strategic business relationship with our colleagues at AWS um, to create a data marketplace for precision medicine. We launched this data marketplace just two weeks ago at the AHA's big scientific uh, sessions meeting, and it was received with great enthusiasm. We have signed up a number of data partners who are coming in and contributing their data, and the goal, of course, is to create sort of a 
cloud of clouds where each of these data owners can own their own data, but it is searchable and accessible across data sets, which in science and research is a huge deal. Uh, Chris mentioned the, um, he didn't call it the million veterans program, but he was talking about the veterans healthcare information completely siloed at this moment. You know, lots of progress being made in trying to make the de-identified data available, but so much promise for what that data could do to help all of you and people you know and love if we could just have access to that data. The other problem that we're trying to solve is that in academic medicine and even in our pharmaceutical company clinical trials and certainly in the government data sets, there are all of these new technologies and capabilities and old models for how data is used and accessed. You know, the amount of information in science and research that's kept on old servers, you know, that has very little um, ability to be used and shared and stored and analyzed is overwhelming. And together, the American Heart Association and AWS intend to change that. And that's a really important part of what we're trying to do. The other thing that we need to do and we're excited to is to integrate new kinds of data. If you ultimately want to get to precision in cardiovascular medicine, we need to know much more about people and their risks than we do today. And so when you look at the data that all of you are generating as you carry around your Fitbit and your sensing devices, if we think about ultimately having smart homes and smart cars where information about how you live your life, you know, what is your heart rate, Chris, you know, every day when you're driving to work versus what your heart rate is right before you're about to go on stage and present. This is valuable information. The episodic nature of information in healthcare today does not allow the best diagnosis and treatment. And so one of the things that we um, intend to do in our collaboration is to create more venues for this personally um, identifiable information that comes across as people live their lives. This can help us get to precision cardiovascular medicine. And we also know that as we work to unlock the keys to um, individuals' own um, risk and their, the best tailored treatments for their risk and disease, that much more information about people is needed. Um, right now, there's a lot of buzz around genomic information, and certainly genomic information is very important. But I would say genomic information in and of itself, uh, to quote one of our uh, amazing scientists, is like stamp collecting. You know, genomic information is stamp collecting because when you have just that and you have it sitting on the shelf, it's not enough to really make a difference in people's lives. We need to pair that with information from their electronic health records, device data, information about how people respond and react to drugs. We need to look at imaging data. And all of this data together, um, made available, submitted and partic by participants who are willing to donate their data, in comparison with other forms of data that are collected over long periods of time really will unlock the mysteries to many diseases. And so um, these uh, new models are helping us, again, make things available like faster access to data. The one marketplace for data sets, I like to say, um, just as Amazon created the marketplace for shopping, I think I must be in the top 1% of Amazon Prime shoppers, I'm sure I am. Uh, we're creating the marketplace for scientific data for cardiovascular disease. Come here, look what's available. Create curated data sets. Um, put them in a sandbox so you can do analytics. Let others come and validate the studies that you're doing. This sounds to many of you who spend your life in technology like, of course, this is such an easy thing to do, but it is not done in science and medicine, and we are doing it together with AWS. This will uh, create more time and money spent on research and improve patient outcomes. And the last thing that I want to mention about the importance of this new networked approach is the importance of inspiring the community to participate in the new data set. And so we have launched also with uh, AWS a series of data grants um, that are going to inspire people to come into this new data infrastructure and help us think about data mining, methods validation, innovative development, and fellowship awards. We encourage any of you that are interested in helping us solve these problems to help save people's lives who are dying from heart attack and stroke and other cardiovascular disorders to come and be part of our community. We have four and a half million dollars worth of grants that are um, being offered right now and we would love to have you join us. Thank you so much again and Teresa, thanks to you and the AWS team for the wonderful partnership. Thank you so much.
guys, this is game changing. I mean, this is really, um, I've done a lot of not-for-profit work in my life, but this is something that really can, can change every life. And we are really passionate about bringing these data sets together. And, and like Nancy said, it's so true. Just, just genomics itself, it's just one piece of the puzzle. So we invite you all to get involved with this. We put a lot of time and effort into thinking through this model. We have a lot of work to do still, but we're getting some of the data sets. We're gonna get more. We've got our program set up. We're trying to open it up to, again, every individual that's out there that has a desire to help cure, uh, has an idea. So come join us in this fight, right, Nancy? Thank you. All right, so now let's talk about connected learning. The favorite part of my week so far, I have to admit, we spent time with students two days ago. It was so fun, so amazing. And we had, I think there was about 75. They came from a charter school locally. We brought uh, computer kits. They built computers. They learned how to do some coding. They were so smart and really it was cool. And one of the kids on stage, I brought a few of them on stage and asked them questions. And they were talking about NASA and they were using Raspberry Pi. And they were like, I know NASA uses Raspberry Pi. And I said, well, you know, I just happen to know a guy who's the CTO of NASA JPL. Would you like to talk to him? They're like, yes. So I called, I called Tom Sostrom. I don't know if Tom was able to make it this morning. But I called Tom and I said, Tom, are you here yet? He said, yes. He came right upstairs. He talked to these students. And I said, Tom, I think literally you may have changed the course of some careers for these students. It was so cool and so amazing to see their eyes light up as he talked about how NASA used this technology and got them. And they asked like amazing questions. I was like, wow, they're so smart. And I told the team, we should be doing this all over the world. This shouldn't be a one-off for reInvent. We should be doing this with students around the world. So it's one of my new goals now to plant these everywhere around the world and teach students how do they build computers, how do they do, how do they do coding. So more of that to come. But educational institutions are doing amazing work now, do, taking transition to IT and thinking about IT in new ways but they're not doing it alone. They need help from partners, from the ecosystem. They need to be able to have those tools provided to them sometimes and some help along the way. So with that, what I'd like to do is to have an individual come to the stage that can talk to you about how they've changed the course of their own technology and how they're utilizing cloud in a way that really drives connectedness. And part of the way that we're working with them and some of our other partners is through our new program that we launched, uh, version two of AWS Educate. And I am so excited about this, and I hope you guys are. We talked about it last year, and now it's a reality. We have created something called Cloud Career Pathways. And through AWS Educate now, not only are we gonna train and educate the students, but we're gonna allow them to select their pathway. And there's already two that we've been talking about new. One, we know we gotta do a research one. We've talked about doing a peace one. We were at the Peace Institute where we're gonna start a new innovation center you'll hear about later this week. But now we're just security. We talked about security yesterday with Trend Mike at Rowe. Lots of new career pathways that students can take advantage of from a cloud perspective. And they can do this through digital credentialing. And after we digitally credential these students, we're gonna allow them to take their credentials, post them on a jobs board, and those jo the jobs board now is gonna have jobs that are posted from our partners like AWS, Amazon, Salesforce, Intel, and many others. So we welcome all of our partners to put your jobs up here. And then students can get hired based on that credentialing. So the idea is to train them, set them up for a career, and then help them get the job. So that's what we wanna do around the world. And we're, we're launching this, uh, it's in the UK, Canada, the US, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, China, and India. And there'll be more countries that we're launching coming this year. So in technology, everywhere I go, people say, look, I need your help getting the right skills. Skills are so important. And we know that it's our job to help create those. And again, I welcome all you all to participate in creating those right skills and hiring these students as we actually get them trained. So now, 
I'd like to welcome to the stage one of our great partners, a Lucien and Toby Williams, who's the SVP and Chief Product and Strategy Officer, 3,000 higher ed tech professionals around the world. And Toby, I don't know, I met you maybe three and a half years ago where we started talking about our journey. So come tell everybody about it. Welcome, Toby, to the stage. Thanks very much, Teresa, and thanks to uh, the AWS team for having us. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to start with a true client story on Cloud Elucian and how we're working together with AWS. Um, this building is Imperial College. It's one of Imperial College in London's buildings. It's specifically in the Kensington section of London. Uh, and Imperial is a, a perennially ranked as a top five research institute worldwide. Um, this building that you see here literally housed the research that helped crack the human genome. Now fast forward 10 years from that, and this building was literally filled with a data center and servers. Some of the most expensive real estate in one of the most expensive cities and one of the most expensive blocks in the world uh, being used for a data center. Today, we, uh, Elucian, in partnership with AWS, are helping Imperial move that uh, data center into the cloud, uh, put this building back to work in research, and help put dollars back to work for scholarships versus funding servers. So for context, uh, Elucian provides the software applications that colleges and universities worldwide use to actually run their institutions. Our applications are touching more than 18 million students at more than 2,500 clients in more than 40 countries around the world, and we're running our applications on AWS. And I can't actually read this quote without a smirk or a laugh, but Gartner suggests in a, in a research note that by 2020, a no cloud policy will be as rare as a no internet policy. Uh, and so while that, that quote may seem antiquated or, or irrelevant to uh, everybody in this room, it's actually still relevant in higher education today because our sector, our industry, hasn't adopted uh, new technologies, and in particular cloud, as fast as some of the other commercial spaces. But today, as we approach 2017, cloud is actually a key to our ability to provide our clients, and importantly, their students, with a modern, mobile, and connected experience on campus that's really, really important. So to provide that experience, we at Elucian are actually transforming our whole business. Uh, at the AWS Public Sector Summit uh, in DC this past June, Andy Jassy said, and I quote, most people believe that what you are is what you've been. So this quote really stuck a chord with, with us at Elucian, given the fact that we're transforming our whole business. As many people, many of our clients, many of our uh, uh, competitors or analysts knew us as a legacy on-prem ERP company. But we knew that to maintain our leadership in higher education, we needed to transform not just our whole application set, but our whole business to become a true modern cloud company. Uh, and that's really at the center of our transformation at Lucian. And AWS, to, to, to Teresa's comment, has been with us literally every step of the way. So our mission at Lucian is really to support student success. And we're doing that through the applications that we provide. And I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, our applications are really focused on delivering a best-in-class user experience for faculty, administrators, staff, and students on campus, helping uh, drive institutional growth, helping institutions increase their operational efficiency, and then overall supporting the success of their students on campus. And cloud is really at the center of how we are helping our clients accomplish this mission. But there's significant challenges throughout the industry. Uh, the U.S. Department of Ed reports that only 55% of students at private nonprofit colleges in the U.S. will graduate within six years. So that's astonishing to me. So when I was in school, the measure was four years. Now it's pushed to six, and it's still a really, really low comp completion rate in that time frame. Student debt's also a significant issue. Today, the average student debt, per, student debt load per student is north of $30,000. That's up 56% since 2004, and it's only going north from here. So through our focus on student success and some of the applications that I'll talk about, we're helping our customers and importantly, we're helping our students make sure that as many people as possible are graduating on time and on budget with as little debt as possible. One of the things that we're providing is a full CRM suite of products that's running in the cloud on AWS, giving recruiters from our institutions the ability to rec to recruit the best students that are the best fit for the institutions, giving advisors on campus the immediate notifications when a student goes off track with their academic progress and is otherwise at risk so that they can step in uh, and get them back on track from a retention and then a graduation standpoint. It's also giving development officers the tools they need out there in the field, talking to donors or alumni to, uh, alumni, to make sure that the next conversation they have stands the best chance of uh, raising money for the institutions that are actually going to help fuel their growth. These applications are just the backbone of how institutions are, are running today. They cover the entire student life cycle, and again, they're running uh, in the cloud on AWS. There's also a global sea change happening in terms of what, what the quote-unquote traditional student looks like. 
Only 20, 29% of students today are traditional 18 to 22 year olds who are coming directly out of secondary school and enrolling in colleges and universities. 38% of those enrolled are over 25 years of age, 25% are over 30 years of age, and a full third of those people who are those students who are enrolled part time are actually working full time to support their education. So there's a, a huge shift in what the, uh, what the student base looks like, and this is on a global basis. Students need more flexibility than ever. They need to be able to engage with their educational institutions uh, more conveniently when they want to. They need to be able to consume their coursework with more flexibility when they want to uh, and how they want to. And so institutions really need to grow and shift their models and to evolve to be able to, to meet these changing demands. One of the ways that we're helping them do that is through our Lucian Brainstorm solution. It's a competency-based education platform that's running on AWS, and it was purpose-built to provide the flexibility to allow students to engage with their uh, institutions and their coursework really at their own pace, uh, and it gives the working adults their, uh, the ability to pursue their educations at their own convenience. Uh, and I think in many cases, it's actually giving them a path to a better life. One of our clients, uh, the University of Incarnate Word in Texas, is using our Brainstorm application to offer a basic cardiac rhythm interpretation course with our brainstorm solution and those that are coming through that course of study and getting certified are able to go get jobs in the market that are paying north of $45,000 a year. So for these students it really is, it's a path to a better life for them. Budget cuts, budget challenges are more critical than ever. They're having a bigger impact than ever across the higher ed landscape. So after adjusting for inflation, the funding for public two and four year institutions in, uh, in the US is more than $10 billion below what it was it, in, it, just before the recession. And at the same time, there's been uh, a large number of tuition freezes at major universities across the US. So the budget pressures are more real than ever. One of the things we're doing to help institutions fight this budget pressure is providing them with real-time data to make better decisions and have better insights to actually increase their operational efficiencies so that they can stretch their budgets as far as possible. We've, built a, uh, we, we've purpose built an analytics platform just for higher education. It's running on, in the cloud and it's running on AWS. So this classroom could be any institution anywhere in the world. Uh, it's got students, it's got computers, but the computers are showing anything but the coursework. Uh, the students are looking at YouTube, they're looking at Facebook, maybe they're doing their holiday shopping on Amazon.com, whatever it might be. But I think it reflects the fact that students really want to engage differently. And largely that means they want to engage through their mobile devices. We know that students are carrying an average of 3.1 mobile devices every day on campus. And it's really changed the way that they want to engage. And they have a really, really high uh, standard for what they want their user experience to be as they're engaging with, those, uh, with their institutions. It's become the de facto interface for uh, uh, the students at over 1,000 of our clients globally. It's how they're registering for classes. They're doing that the same way they buy music, and they're also tracking their academic progress uh, the same way they keep tabs on their friends and family with Facebook. As I close, I wanted to just show a couple, of a couple of quotes. This one is from a client. I think it shows the way that cloud is really changing the way higher education, the business of higher education is run. I think it also reflects the change in mindset in IT leadership uh, in higher education across the globe. Um, last one, I also wanted to show a student quote. This is an actual student tweet from a student who was using our DegreeWorks application to plan and track their uh, academic progress. Just looked on DegreeWorks and saw that I'm, a class, that I'm classified as a sophomore now. Thank God, first man in my family to make it this far. This is what we're doing every day with the application set, and we're grateful to our partners at AWS for helping us drive student success. So thanks very much for having us. Quote. Um, thank you, Toby and Elysian. I, I will have to say, we have been on a journey with them, and I remember a meeting with Toby in our offices, and I think it was like three and a half years ago, and you're in the Virginia area. We're like, why have we not met before now? But he asked us at the time, uh, they were trying to make a decision about cloud, and I, it was a big decision. I mean, you're changing how you're going to business and how you're asking your customers to consume that business model. And the big thing we talked about was partnership. I remember very clearly you asked me, what kind of partner are you going to be? And I said, we're going to be a good partner. <laughs> and we're going to do what we say we're going to do. And I hope you feel like we've been that because we feel like you've been a really good uh, partner and customer of ours. So thank you. So I want to thank all of our speakers, by the way. Were they not awesome? Is it just me? I just love what they're doing. It's, 
Let me tell you, I learn, my team, we learn every day from our customers and partners. I mean, I'm always like, really, you can do that? That's awesome. So they're sort of teaching us every day and pushing us uh, in new ways to do things. All right, now, we're coming to an end, and just a few sort of housekeeping things that I want to share with all of you guys. One is, we started with connectedness, and I'm going to end with connectedness. There's a thousand ways you guys need to come together. I know there's many things going on in your mind about why you're here and what you need to learn. But what I'm hoping you take away again from this breakfast are new business models, new areas that you can think about, and also, again, connecting with each other and understanding how others are actually making their move to the cloud and really, really learning from that. And I want to invite you all, by the way, as you connect, to connect with us tonight because we're having our public sector party and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's an 80s theme. It's on your table. We've got a little slide up here for you on it, so we'd love for you to come. We're also having a women in technology panel tomorrow at 1130, and it's not just for women. We'd like men to come too. We have executives from Netflix, Salesforce, University of Maryland, and Girls Who Code is going to be the moderator. I'll be there. And then I'm also doing a panel discussion at the Executive Summit on our Scalarator that we launched in the Middle East in Bahrain. Uh, you'll hear about how we're changing the dynamics, even doing that, and around the world how new business models are shaping. So again, you better hightail it to get a seat uh, to Andy Jassy's keynote. I thank you all so much for coming today and really appreciate your partnership. Thank you, guys. Have a great reInvent.